Do you ever get bored of regular old water? Sparkling water is where it's at, especially Focus water. Focus is a delicious, health-conscious, thoughtfully caffeinated sparkling water. They're infused with a boost of natural tea caffeine and a balance of L-theanine. With Focus, you're getting that clean energy that you want, but without the sugar, calories or the crash. Focus has 75 milligrams of caffeine, with zero calories, zero sugar and zero sweeteners. It's even GMO-free and can help you ditch the fizzy sodas or energy drinks that are filled with rubbish and damage your teeth. Focus uses a natural caffeine which is derived from tea and gives you the same boost as an 8-ounce cup of coffee, but in a more refreshing and thirst-quenching form. They even offer a variety of amazing flavours, including blood orange, cherry cola, root beer, yuzu and lime, cucumber and peach, crisp apple and mixed berry. Just head on over to drinkfocus.com. That is d-r-i-n-k-p-h-o-c-u-s dot com and use code MORBID for 20% off your order or simply click the link in my show notes. Like most of you, I'm hoping that things will get back to normal soon and we can hang out with our friends, go to the bar and even travel. If you're wanting to keep yourself preoccupied while we wait for some normalcy, download Best Fiends. It's been keeping me preoccupied during the past while. And it's a great game filled with cute characters, which is a refreshing break from true crime writing. They've even sponsored today's episode of Morbidology. With Best Fiends, the fun never ends. There's thousands of levels and tons of characters. I'm on level 291, but there's new puzzles to solve each and every day. It's one of those games where 30 minutes really feels like 30 seconds. Best Fiends is super easy to follow and it's fun to play. It's a casual game that won't stress you out and it's very easy to pass the time with. I find myself playing it before bed and when I need a break while writing. Download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Welcome to Morbidology. I'm your host, Emily G. Thompson, author of Unsolved Child Murders, Cults Uncovered, Mysteries Uncovered, and co-author of Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. Join Morbidology on Patreon for exclusive episodes of Morbidology Plus, exclusive merch, ad-free and early release episodes, and much more. In 2007, a young woman vanished in Christchurch, New Zealand after arranging to meet somebody who was interested in buying her car. When she didn't return home, her family reported her missing. The young woman was deaf and her disappearance would bring the hearing and deaf communities closer than ever before as they both worked together to try and bring her home safely. It was November of 2007 when the family of 20-year-old Emma Agnew reported her missing. Emma was a young deaf woman living in Christchurch, New Zealand, when she was reported missing. The last time that her family had heard from her was on the 15th of November 2007 at around 10.30am. She informed them that she was planning on meeting up with a man who was interested in purchasing her car, which was a Mazda Familia. Later that night, police found Emma's fire-damaged Mazda Familia in Bromley Park, just a few metres away from Linwood Cemetery. It was an extremely sinister discovery, which exacerbated the fears of Emma's family. Her father, Henry, and her brother, Toby, who were also deaf, made desperate pleas for any information which could lead to Emma. They spoke through a sign language interpreter, as they shared the same information they shared to police that Emma had been advertising her car with a sign 
and cell phone number in the car window. They said that on the morning of Emma's disappearance, she was contacted by somebody who was coming to see the car. Toby said, Someone visited her and something has happened. The family had become immediately concerned for Emma's welfare when they couldn't reach her. She had never been missing before and it was completely out of character for her to just vanish and not stay in contact with her family. While the family were stating that somebody had arranged to meet Emma to view her car, Detective Inspector Tom Fitzgerald said that this had not yet been confirmed. He said that it was true that the car was up for sale and that Emma had received a plethora of text messages about the car from strangers who were interested in purchasing the car. However, he said that they had not yet confirmed that she had arranged to meet anybody, before adding, Locating the damaged car in Bromley Park gives us great concern. Emma was an extremely friendly and outgoing young woman. She was exceptionally close with her family. Her aunt Evelyn Pateman described Emma as a very special person. She said that she loved having a good time. Her cousin Jacinda Buzzard said that Emma loved hugging people, driving and being around her family. She said, She's a beautiful person, deep into her soul. Another cousin, Priscilla Buzzard, said that Emma loved a party, but was very wise and sensible. You can see photographs of Emma up on the Vodacast app. Emma, her mother Louise, her father Henry, and her three brothers were deaf, and they all used sign language to communicate. While Emma could lip-read, she could not vocalise words. Emma also worked part-time as an administration assistant for the Deaf Sports Federation of New Zealand and the Deaf Society of Canterbury. She was very active within the deaf community and had just recently competed in netball at the New Zealand Deaf Games, which was held in Auckland over the Labour weekend. Emma was also exceptionally clever and she enjoyed learning sign language from other countries. She was also known as a role model within the deaf community. She had moved into a home in Linwood, which she shared with a friend. She had chosen this area to live in particular because she wanted to be closer to the town. She wanted to be able to go out and not have to worry about driving home. Modern technology, such as texting and Facebook, had allowed Emma to move with ease between the deaf and hearing worlds. As a young child, she communicated with her friends in school via notes and blossomed into a very confident young woman who was never slowed down by her lack of hearing. In fact, a lot of people were so drawn to Emma that they took sign language classes so that they could get to know her better. Her classmate, Andy Savage, was one of these people. He said to the press, Meeting Emma is what started me learning sign language, but as I learned more and more about the language, I enjoyed it more. Another friend, Matt Yankis, was the same. He learned sign language just for Emma and said, Being deaf didn't slow her down at all. Investigators would appeal to the public to come forward if they had seen Emma at any point since she left her home in Linwood on the Thursday at around 5.15am. One person would come forward and say that they had seen Emma in her car in the city centre shortly after 10am. When Emma left the home, she was driving in the direction of her work, but she never arrived. She had been wearing black flared trousers and a navy blue hooded top. The following day, investigators working on the disappearance would state that they feared that Emma was the victim of foul play and asked if anybody had seen a silver Japanese car circling Bromley Park, near where Emma's burned-out car was found. One person who lived in the area did come forward and said that they had seen a silver car but they did not think that the occupants of said car were suspicious. Tony Borlees, who lived opposite of where the car was found, said that he had been alerted to the burning car by a passerby. He walked over to the car park and passed the silver car. He said, They had the lights on in the car. They didn't seem concerned at all. He said the two occupants had made no attempt to hide or conceal their faces, and they didn't come across as suspicious. Investigators would announce that the couple in the silver car had been ruled out of their inquiries, but they would shift their attention to a man who was seen walking a dog near where Emma's burning car was found. This man warned a group of people that Emma's car was going to blow up. He was described as a white man, around 30 to 40 years old, with light brown hair, which was short on the top but shaved on the sides. 
He was estimated to be 1.85 metres tall and was of solid build. He was wearing a dark jacket and jeans when he was walking a white, short-haired pit bull cross-type dog. While they were wanting to identify this man to speak to him, they said that he was not a suspect. Investigators would also announce that they had pieced together Emma's last known movements before she vanished and said that they believed that after 10.15am she may have been in St Albans. Papa Nui, Belfast or Redwood, adding that she had been uncontactable since 10.35am. While Detective Fitzgerald refused to elaborate, he said she and her phone were out that way. Meanwhile, Emma's family were extremely proactive in the search. Her aunt Evelyn was coordinating a poster appeal for information about her niece's whereabouts. The posters would feature a photograph of Emma during a trip to Paris the previous July. Evelyn said that the family didn't want to think the worst, and that they were remaining hopeful that Emma would come home safely. Another poster was put up outside the Christchurch Deaf Association to advertise a bank account which had been set up by members of the deaf community for donations to help them find Emma. They raised over $1,500 in just one day, and that would ultimately swell to over $20,000. As the search for Emma continued, investigators would take her computer to forensically examine it. This fueled speculation that Emma may have been in contact with somebody before her disappearance. As this was underway, a police helicopter as well as ground searchers, embarked on the Spencer Park and Brooklyn's area of Northern Christchurch. While their presence was noticeable, they refused to elaborate on why they were searching this specific area, which led to fear among the community that they were searching for a body. Meanwhile, a prayer meeting was held at New Brighton Pier, where more than 80 locals and members of the deaf community showed up to pray for Emma's safe return. Just the following day, The search for Emma shifted to the Spencerville area, in particular, the river. Police dive teams, as well as heat-seeking equipment, were on the scene to assist in the search. They were concentrating on the Lower Styx River and Cheney's Plantation, which is a seven-square-kilometre plantation. Investigators said that they had received a number of tips, but they would not say what exactly had led them to this area. Seemingly... The search in this area was unfruitful and investigators started to focus on North Canterbury's Cape Valley landfill. Detective Inspector Fitzgerald said that they were looking for any of Emma's belongings in the landfill. He also revealed that the forensic examination of Emma's computer did not reveal anything which could assist in their investigation. While investigators were remaining tight-lipped, Canterbury Waste Service General Manager Gareth James would tell the Sunday Star Times that they were particularly interested in rubbish that was put out for curbside collection on show day, which was a public holiday. And they were interested in rubbish which had come from two specific homes. Just two days later, it was announced that a body had been found on the northern outskirts of Christchurch in the search for Emma. The grim discovery had come 12 days after Emma had vanished. The body had been found at around 7.30pm, by a dog walker in Spencer Park. It was located just behind the Spencer Beach Holiday Park in a wooded area at the northern end of the Blue Track. This track ran all the way through Bottle Lake Forest Park and into Spencer Park area. The body had been purposefully hidden with foliage from the forest. The body would be positively identified as Emma. She was found with a sock stuffed into the back of her throat and had suffocated to death. You can read more about this on the Vodacast app. Just hours after the discovery of the body, a 35-year-old unemployed man would be arrested and charged with the murder of Emma. Detective Inspector Fitzgerald said that the man was transient and had moved around the South Island. He had been identified as a suspect in the murder as the result of intensive inquiries. He would be identified as Liam James Reed. The discovery really shattered the community who had worked around the clock to try and bring Emma home safely. Jenna Whitley, one local, said to the press that she was going to be in court to see Liam charged with Emma's murder. She said, I will probably yell out to him, and he'll listen and hear my voice, and I will repeat back to him, your victim never heard you. How cruel can someone be to take such a young, innocent life? 
Many said that the hole that Emma's death had left within the deaf community would never be filled. Her disappearance, and now her death, had brought the hearing and deaf communities closer, more so than ever before. It had sparked nationwide awareness of Emma, the deaf community, and all of her suffering family. The media would expose sign language on every single report on the case, which had never been seen before, creating a massive awareness of the case and of the deaf community as a whole. Liam would appear in court where he was charged with murdering Emma on the day that she disappeared. He was remanded into custody for a pre-deposition conference, which was scheduled for December. As he was let out of court, a scuffle ensued, accompanied by a lot of swearing and shouting from those who were in the courtroom gallery. Judge Gary McCaskill lambasted the scuffle, calling it an appalling display of lawlessness, while Deaf Association of New Zealand Chief Executive Rachel Noble, said that she was disappointed by the aggression. She said that they had wanted respect and a quiet time for Emma. Emma's aunties, Evelyn Pateman and Della Buzzard, spoke on behalf of Emma's parents and asked supporters to conduct themselves with care, stating, let's remember Emma today and remember her as we know she would want. They had made it abundantly clear that the outburst was not what Emma would have wanted and it certainly wasn't what her family wanted either. It wasn't an appropriate tribute for a victim of crime. During court appearances, in particular the first one where everybody gets to see the suspect for the first time, emotions do run high. But Emma had no room in her life for angry clamour, and the reaction of some in attendance had really upset those who were closest to Emma. Following the arrest of Liam, investigators would announce that they were looking into whether He was involved in other crimes throughout New Zealand. As soon as he was arrested, there was speculation that he was involved in a brutal rape of a woman in Dunedin just days before he was arrested. The 21-year-old victim had been subjected to a two-hour assault in which she was strangled and had a nylon rope tied around her neck. The man in question had been described as a European man in his late 20s or early 30s with a shaved head. Liam had actually changed his name within the past five years and had previously went as Julian Heath Edgecombe. Liam had been adopted by his grandfather and grandmother, Albert and Josephine Edgecombe, when he was four years old after his mother had left him at a Salvation Army home and moved to Australia, leaving him behind. Albert said that his father had wanted nothing to do with him, so they adopted him. He had lived with his grandparents until he was 15 years old. They asked him to leave the home after he had gone a bit wayward, as Albert had said. According to Albert, he hadn't heard from Liam in around 15 years. He would state that his heart was with Emma's family. The past few months have been super busy for me, from crime con to morbidology and freelance writing. Sometimes you just need to relieve some stress. Well, Papa and Barkley create award-winning CBD solutions for stress, discomfort, sleep and just general everyday wellness. What's even better is that Papa and Barkley have an unmatched, clean, chemical-free and whole plant process with proven results. Papa and Barkley CBD Relief Balm delivers hours of comfort with simple plant-based ingredients. This was created because the founder, Adam Grossman, wanted to ease his father's debilitating back pain. From this powerful homemade balm, Papa and Barkley have expanded to a full line of tropical balms, oils, tinctures and capsules. All are made with 100% clean, natural ingredients and whole plant full-spectrum CBD. Today, Papa and Barkley are the number one cannabis wellness company in California, and with their new CBD relief line, they can ship nationwide. I have a friend who plays tennis, and I shared my Papa and Barkley products with them. She always has a nagging pain in her elbow, and the Papa and Barkley balm gave a warming sensation that helped tremendously. Papa and Barkley is on a mission to improve lives through CBD in its purest, cleanest form possible. Go to papaandbarkleycbd.com slash morbidology for 20% off your first purchase. That's 20% off for new customers at P-A-P-A and B-A-R-K-L-E-Y cbd.com slash morbidology. Is there something interfering with your happiness or are you apprehensive about reaching out for help? 
BetterHelp is here to help you and they're today's sponsor of Morbidology. BetterHelp is not self-help, it's professional counselling available to you online or over the phone. BetterHelp is more affordable and accessible than traditional offline counselling and they offer financial aid. Sadly, sometimes traditional offline counselling is not locally available for everybody, but BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide. They have licensed professional counsellors specialising in a broad variety of areas, including depression, sleeping, self-esteem, grief and much more. Everything you share with your counsellor is confidential and they are matched to your specific needs. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash morbidology. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash morbidology. In 2005, Liam had unsuccessfully taken legal action against the government for $40,000 after claiming that a public servant had assaulted him. However, his defence lawyer was forced to admit in the court that Liam had suffered no injuries and had only suffered hurt feelings. The judge would find that Liam had actually provoked the attack by saying a racist slur. The employee in question lost his job over the incident and died 18 months later. According to colleagues, his life had fallen apart because of the ordeal. You can learn more about this on the Vodacast app. Emma's funeral would be held on the 3rd of December at the Aurora Performing Arts Centre in Burnside High School. While the community were allowed to attend the funeral, no TV cameras were permitted. As her parents, Henry and Louise, said, they did not want to be reliving the funeral service as it was broadcast on television. Around a thousand people packed into the centre to pay their final respects to Emma. It was led by sign language celebrant Tony Walton, who began with the song I Miss You, which was translated into sign language by Lisa Walburn. Walton took the mourners through Emma's life, stating that she was a child at the heart of a loving family. Photographs depicting her life were projected and it showed a typical Kiwi upbringing. She was the only girl of the family with three brothers. And she was very much a daddy's girl, often spending time fishing with her father, Henry. Walton said, She loved the tranquility, the scenery, not having any worries with her dad. Emma's brother Toby described how Emma's ability with language meant that she had the job of filling out paperwork for all of the family, while her cousin, Bonnie Buzzard, said that she would walk into her room and light it up. Her friends also spoke of her determination to succeed, while some spoke about how they took up sign language classes, just to get to know their friend a bit better. Through Walton, Emma's parents thanked the community for all of the support and love they had shown them. They also thanked the investigators who had worked tirelessly on the case, stating, Even the closeness and the concern that the police showed was really evident. They got behind the fact that Emma was a special person, and they stepped up too. Following the service, the family held a private burial. Her father and her three brothers would carry her coffin from the service to the awaiting hearse. As her body was being lowered into the ground, a monarch butterfly was released and it hovered for a moment over her casket. Her Aunt Margaret said, It was the most amazing special thing I'd ever seen. Many species of butterflies are deaf, and they symbolise freedom and independence for the deaf community. In March of the following year, Liam attempted to take his life in jail by overdosing on prescription medication. Sensible sentencing trust spokesman Garth McVicker said that Liam was not popular among the other inmates. He was held in the hospital overnight before being released back into jail. A couple of weeks later, the deposition hearing would be held in court. Crown prosecutor Pip Curry said that Liam had admitted to his then-girlfriend that he had killed Emma, stating he had killed Emma, the deaf girl. She detailed the facts of the event, such as Emma's cause of death, and where her body had been found. She revealed that Emma had been found nude with bruising around her neck and deep genital bruising, which the pathologist Dr. Martin Sage believed had come from a punch or kick. There was also evidence that Emma had been sexually assaulted. 
Prosecutor Curry revealed that the prosecution's case against Liam would present records from cell phone towers, which showed that Emma and Liam's phones were in close proximity in Central Christchurch, and then they travelled north to Spencerville together. The cell phones were both unused for around an hour, and then both travelled back to the city together. According to the prosecution, Emma was dead by this point, and her cell phone was brought back to the city by Liam. She further revealed that Liam's fingerprints were found on Emma's car. During the hearing, the former girlfriend of Liam, who was unidentified, would testify. The ex-girlfriend said that she had met Liam in early 2007, and then started a relationship with him in the September. She said that on the day of Emma's disappearance, she had broken up with him, and he had sent her a number of threatening text messages. Liam told her that he would come to her house and cause a big scene. The text messages ended at 10.25am and then began again at 1.18pm. In this message, Liam asked her for drugs, stating that he needed something to relax. She said that later on, during the search for Emma, she unwillingly took Liam on holiday at Spencer Beach Holiday Park which was near where Emma's body would be found. She said that while here, police descended on the area and Liam became paranoid and jumped out of the window of their cabin and fled into the woods. Then on the 24th of November, Liam and a friend had come to the woman to get a lift to Wigram Lodge. She said that she took them there, the friend left and then Liam became tearful and expressed thoughts of suicide. She said that he cried and that he said he was not being long for this world. She said that she knew that something serious must have happened and asked him if he had done something which would affect her access to her children. He responded, yes. She told the courtroom. He stopped, looked straight at me and said, I killed the girl. I said, do you mean Emma Agnew? He said, yes. I said, did you rape her? He said yes. She said that Liam told her he had snapped and regretted what he had done and that he would never do it again. That night, the ex-girlfriend called police. A series of text messages between Liam and the woman following his confession were read aloud. She had asked him where Emma's body was and he replied that he didn't know what she was talking about. After several similar text messages back and forth, the woman texted Liam and said that she was confused before writing. I want to check myself into rehab. I feel like I'm losing the plot. The last couple of days seem like a crazy dream. The woman referred to herself as a Judas and wrote, I wished it was me you had done. If you feel inclined, I offer myself. I'm not of this world anymore, please forgive me. She was referring to the fact that she had called police on Liam. And at one point he texted her, To whatever pig is reading this, I said nothing of the sort. Following her testimony, her truthfulness would be called into question. Defence attorney David Bunce put it to the woman that she had misrepresented the nature of her relationship with Liam, revealing that she was involved in large-scale drug dealing. She responded that she knew that Liam would try and find a way to discredit her. The defence accused her of supplying Liam with 14 ounces of cannabis, but she responded by saying that she had only given him a small bag before stating, I thought Liam would find something to bring me up on. She was asked if she used pee, which was methamphetamine, but she denied it. He questioned why she said to Liam via text message that she wanted to check into rehab, and she said it was a metaphor to allude to her confused state. She said she smoked one or two joints a day and was not a sufficient problem to seek help. Defence Bunn suggested that violence and then reconciliation were part of an ongoing cycle in the relationship between the couple, and these were not isolated events surrounding the murder that she had made them out to be. She responded, Not correct. For all that happened, I never felt fear with him. On that particular day, I did. She accepted that they were a strange and mismatched couple, and said that they had shared a strong and compelling attraction to one another. Even as she was testifying against him, Liam had mouthed, I love you to her from the dock, and said, I'll be seeing you soon, as she left the courtroom. Ultimately, it would be decided by the judge that there was enough evidence for Liam to stand trial for murder. He would additionally be charged with the rape on the Dunedin woman, 
which had taken place a couple of days before his arrest. He was also ordered to stand trial for this crime. This case had been progressing separately with Liam's name suppressed, until the prosecution had successfully applied to have the two cases joined because of the similarities as well as the overlapping time frame. The trial would begin in October of 2008. During opening statements, Prosecutor Curry described their case against Liam as overwhelming. She said that the murder of Emma was a pattern of sexual violence demonstrated by Liam's unusual signature act, which was punching his victims in the genital area. She revealed that the rape victim had also been punched, as well as Emma. She said testimony from Liam's former girlfriend would be cornerstone to their case, when she would reveal that she and Liam would indulge in rape play sex games, which included strangulation. She would testify that on one occasion Liam had gone too far and ignored their safe word and punched her in the genitals. Defence Bunns would reject the prosecution's case as prejudicial froth during his opening statements, saying that Liam's defence was that he did not commit either the rape or the murder. He asked the jury to remain vigilant and not prejudge the case. The courtroom was packed with loved ones and supporters of Emma, many of whom were from the deaf community. There were five translators in the courtroom, two of whom were translating for deaf witnesses and three of whom were translating all of the proceedings. Stuart Monk, the man who had found Emma's body, would detail the grim discovery to the courtroom. He said that he was walking his dogs on a forest track near Spencer Park when his dogs began sniffing around 20 metres off the main track. He said that his dogs had done the same thing the day previously. This time, however, he decided that he would investigate. He pushed through the undergrowth and crawled underneath a fallen tree. He said he noticed a mound that was covered with leaves, which didn't look right, as in it looked like a man-made construction. He said to the courtroom, I moved some of the leaves with my foot. It was a woman's head. He said that he saw teeth and an ear, and immediately left the scene and flagged down a passerby to alert police. He knew that Emma was missing and his immediate thought was that the body he had found was possibly hers. The pathologist who had conducted Emma's autopsy, Dr Martin Sage, would testify about the injuries that had been inflicted on Emma. He said that the body showed scratches, which indicated that she had been dragged by her head to the location where she was found by Stuart. Bruises were found on her neck and in her genital area, and a sock was found stuffed in her mouth. Dr. Sage said to the courtroom that the sock could have caused Emma's death, but it could have been a factor to ensure that she would not survive. He said that decomposition had made it difficult to tell if there were any head injuries, which could have contributed to Emma's death. Defence Bunns asked if there were marks around Emma's neck, which indicated throttling, and Dr. Sage responded that there wasn't, before adding that they could have been masked by decomposition. It would be revealed very early on during the trial that Liam had spoken to friends about strangling a woman during sex. Warren Wallace, a former colleague of Liam at Scope Industries, said that he had mentioned strangling women during sex. Prosecutor Brent Stanaway asked if he thought that Liam was joking or being serious, to which he replied, half and half. Another friend would testify that just days before Emma vanished, Liam had told him that he was feeling suicidal and violent towards others. The woman, whose name was suppressed, said that Liam had texted her on the 12th of November, stating that if his girlfriend broke up with him, he would take his own life. He wrote that it was better that he goes rather than what might happen to somebody else. This woman was so concerned that she rang Liam. She testified, He said it should be other people's safety that I should be concerned about, because if he didn't do something to himself, It would be to somebody else. Three days later, Emma vanished. Kenneth Andrew, who lived on a boat in Nelson, would tell the jury that he was aboard a vessel which belonged to Burton Shipley, the husband of former Prime Minister Jenny Shipley. It was the 17th of November when Liam came to the vessel, asking for passage to Australia. He said that he did not have a passport because he had been in trouble with the law, and said that he would work his way over and then somebody would meet him in Australia and pick him up. He said that it was Liam's very foul mouth which had stuck in his mind. 
Testimony would then be heard from a number of investigators who had worked on the disappearance and murder case. Luminol testing for the presence of blood in Emma's burning car was negative. However, a pubic-like hair was discovered and it belonged to Liam, placing him in Emma's car. Defence attorney Glenn Henderson would question the integrity of the investigation. He highlighted a photograph which showed an ungloved hand touching a window during the examination of the car. The photograph had come from the media, and Defence Henderson questioned how the media could have access to a site investigators said was secure. Detective Constable Craig Johnson, however, responded by stating that the photo in question was taken during a media conference where the media were kept from directly accessing the car. The ungloved hand in the photograph was taken to show the position of the hand which had made a partial palm print on the window. The palm print was identified as belonging to Liam. Fingerprint expert Brent Wilson would testify about the palm print. It had been found on the right rear door of Emma's car after it was found ablaze. Forensic scientist Rosalind Ruff then testified about the pubic-like hair. It had been found in the rear of Emma's car and came back as an extremely strong match for Liam. Analysis of Liam's clothing only found his DNA, as well as DNA of his former girlfriend. Four witnesses from Telecom and Vodafone would also testify during the trial about the cell phone evidence. It showed that Liam and Emma were together. Since it was a joint trial for the murder as well as the rape, Testimony would be heard in relation to the rape case. Video footage from a dairy near where the rape was committed was played for the jury. The victim is seen on the footage at 12.04am on the 24th of November, and then Liam is seen on the footage at 2.58am. The rape was alleged to have been committed by Liam during these hours. The victim of the rape would testify during the trial. She said that she was walking home after a night out with her friends, and she was approached by a man she identified as Liam. She said that they spoke for a while, but as she went to leave, he grabbed her by the hair and punched her in the head several times. He then forced her to pretend to be in an embrace with him as a passerby came near them. She said that Liam then dragged her by her hair, up some stairs and into bushes bordering the Spitz factory car park. She said to the jury, He threw me to the ground and told me not to scream or yell, and that he was going to rape me. He said he was serious and he had done this before. He said he had raped someone before and killed them. He then took a black rope from his pocket and put it around her neck, pulling it tightly to show her what would happen if she screamed. The woman cried on the witness stand as she described how he took off all of his clothes and then raped her. She said that during the sexual assault he tugged on the noose and punched her numerous times in the head. On two occasions he punched her in the genitals and continually threatened to kill her. She said to the jury, He said it wasn't about power, it was about sex, and I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Afterwards, he told her to get dressed. She said that he couldn't find the noose and he forced her to search the bushes. She said, He got really angry. He pushed me onto my back and sat on me and started strangling me with extreme force, like he wanted to kill me. She said that she started to black out before getting a massive surge of adrenaline. She said, I thought, I'm not going to die like this. She said that she grabbed Liam's testicles and squeezed them and twisted them as hard as she could. The next thing she knew, she was back at her flat. The woman had identified Liam in a photo montage on the 28th of November. She said that she recognised him right away and that she would never forget his face for as long as she lived. She identified Liam in court as the man who had raped her and attempted to murder her. Dr. Kathy Powell, who had examined the victim the following day, said that she had been inflicted injuries that she had never seen before in her entire career of examining victims of sexual assaults. She said that the woman had injuries to her entire body. Forensic evidence regarding the rape case would also be presented. Blood from Liam's shoes came back as 2,000 million times more likely to have come from the victim as opposed to anybody else, and DNA scraping from underneath the victim's fingernails had come back as a match to Liam. Text messages from that night would be displayed in court. At 1.41am, Liam had texted his girlfriend, I'm very busy at the moment. Secrets that can only be shared face to face. Come to me. Trust me. 
She had replied asking for his story, and Liam responded to her. Okay, baby, you will love it. Trust me. Support for Morbidology in today's episode is brought to you by Incipio. Founded in 1999, Incipio was born with a love for tech and then the novel idea to protect your phone. Now, 20 years later, they're still innovating and making cases with you in mind. For Morbidology, I genuinely depend on my mobile phone. I use it for Zoom calls as well as researching and making notes on the go. I need to make sure that my phone is protected and charged at any given time. Incipio's Geo for MagSafe case combines minimalistic design with maximum protection. As someone who constantly drops their phone, Incipio's Geo for MagSafe case offers 12 feet of drop protection with integrated MagSafe technology to keep it fully charged and protected from the toughest drops. It's also important to keep yourself protected, especially during these times. Well, their antimicrobial protection eliminates 99.9% of surface bacteria that won't wear or wash off. The phone cases genuinely are amazing, and I cannot recommend them enough. I have four cases in different colours. Incipio's Duo for MagSafe is now available to purchase at your local Verizon or online at verizon.com. There would be testimony presented regarding Liam's behaviour following his arrest. A prison officer whose name was suppressed would tell the courtroom that as she was making early observations of Liam, he became extremely abusive. She testified. He said, I wish it was your daughter I fucked and strangled. She said that the remark went above and beyond the usual vulgar comments she is exposed to in her line of career. She later heard Liam having a conversation with another inmate stating, It was good to make the bitch beg. I had to strangle her, to shut the silly cow up. Another prison officer had heard him make the remark, If you're going to kill them, you might as well fuck them first. The former girlfriend of Liam would once again testify about his murder confession. She also revealed that he confessed to raping and attempting to kill the other woman in Dunedin. She said that in the days after the rape, he had become anxious, nervous, and spoke about suicide or dying in a shootout with police. She said that they both shared rape fantasies as well as fantasies of violent sex. During cross-examination, defence bonds accused the woman of being fundamentally dishonest. He accused her of being a drug dealer and said that she had sent Liam text messages initiating violent sex. She said that their relationship was based on sex and once again spoke about the fact that he ignored their safe word. Speaking of Liam's confession to the murder and the rape, she said, he said he didn't regret what he had done and that he would do it again. Defence Bonds put it to the woman that she had portrayed herself as a victim when she was a willing participant. He read out text messages from the woman to Liam in which she described going out at night to streets where she knew that women had been raped. He accused her of putting the blame onto Liam to protect herself. She replied, not true. You can learn more about the testimony on the Vodacast app. Defence Bonds would reveal that while Liam was awaiting trial, his ex-girlfriend, who was now testifying against him, had sent him sexual letters. He said that since Liam's arrest, his ex-girlfriend had sought out rough sex and rape simulation. He cited one letter in which she wrote, I've already had cravings and gone looking for our breed. Defence Bunce would cast doubt on her account of Liam's confession. The defence would call on Liam to testify during the trial. He said that on the morning that Emma vanished, he'd been buying drugs with his friend at a Christ Church address he could not recall. He said that they had gone to a home to purchase methamphetamine, which he later injected. He refused to disclose the friend's name stating he was a bit of a drug dealer and a bit of a gun dealer. He said, It could cause me a bit of trouble in the can. He denied that he had murdered Emma, stating, I've never even met Emma. I've never met her and I've never driven anywhere with her. Speaking of his ex-girlfriend, he said that her characterization of their relationship was incorrect. He said that she had made it out like the relationship was always unusual, but said that some days it was normal. He said, She liked the thought of being raped and controlled. She liked being tied up and strangled. She liked being cut or hit or degraded. She liked forceful rough sex. 
He said that he had never punched her in the genital area like she had testified. He claimed that after they broke up, he sent her angry and threatening text messages and then walked into the city. He said that he had met a friend and they drove out to Shirley to get some methamphetamine. He said he didn't know where they went exactly because his geography of Christchurch was poor. He claimed that his recollection of times and subsequent actions after injecting the methamphetamine was hazy, stating, When I woke on the morning of the 15th of November, I didn't know I was going to get framed for murder two weeks later, so I didn't know I had to remember. Speaking about the rape, he claimed that he was with a second mystery man who he refused to identify. He said that this man, much like the other mystery man, was a criminal figure and said that when the rape was taking place, he and this man were getting into mischief in Dunedin. Prosecutor Curry put it to Liam that he had made both men up in a bid to cover up the murder and the rape. Absolutely, I'm not telling you what his name is. And he could get you off a charge of murder? No, um, I can get myself off a charge of murder with the help of my lawyers. I'm not making stuff up as I go along, this is the way it is. He suggested that these men, who he referred to as friends, would have come forward to help him get out of the murder charge. He responded, I don't need him. You can't place me anywhere near Emma Agnew. You can't place me near Spencer Park. The bottom line is, I don't need him. Speaking about the fact that the rape victim's blood was found on his shoes, he said that her blood must have, by chance, splashed onto his shoes when he was in the same area. He was also asked about how his pubic hair got into Emma's car. A pubic hair could have come from anywhere. It could be transference. It could be that it blew in from the street when somebody opened the door. As for the fact his DNA was found underneath her fingernails, he blamed that on a bloody shoddy botched investigation. I mean, it would be a mistake to, um, for you guys to say that the police don't do that sort of thing. He also claimed that his palm print was on Emma's car because he had looked at it because it was for sale the night before she vanished. At one point he referred to the murder of Emma as the kidnap and murder of Emma. It was a Freudian slip since the prosecution had never used the term kidnap when referring to the murder case. I don't need to explain myself to you who I was with, what I was doing, whatever, because uh, you can't prove otherwise. So. But just to get this clear, you're not going to tell us who you were with. Mm-hmm. You're not going to tell us where you went. I don't need to. Following its testimony, closing arguments were presented. Prosecutor Curry referred to Liam as a smooth-talking criminal, but said that in an instant he could become dangerous and aggressive. She said. The Liam Reid you saw in the witness box is not the one who's out there raping and killing. The at times, well-spoken Liam Reid is the one who can put women at ease and conduct a relationship. He's a real Jekyll and Hyde. Defence bonds urged jurors to disregard aspects of Liam's appearance, including his shaved head and his plethora of tattoos, as well as behaviour they found strange. He said that Liam had been frank and let it all hang out. He said that his testimony had been in contrast to the testimony of his former girlfriend, who he said was totally untruthful and unreliable. The jury would then be sent away to deliberate Liam's fate. He would be found guilty of the rape and murder of Emma Agnew, as well as the rape, sexual violation, robbery and attempted murder of the woman in Dunedin. Outside of court, Emma's brother would speak to the media. I um, just feel like it's just not fair. I mean, we can't bring our sister back to life. And it's changed our life forever. And killing someone is not natural. It's just not fair. Her father, Henry, said that the verdict was really, really good and said that the family were relieved. Speaking about the sentence he hoped Liam would receive, he said, it has to be life. Liam Reid would ultimately be sentenced to preventive detention, which meant he were to be released when the parole board deemed him no longer a threat to society. His minimum parole term was set at 26 years. In handing down the sentence, Judge Justice Chisholm said, You are an evil and dangerous predator. You are arrogant. You seek to dominate, particularly women. You are not without intelligence. That is one of the dangers that underlies your activities. Sadly, there is not the slightest flicker of remorse. As Liam was led from the courtroom, he raised his hands in celebration. Following the verdict, another former girlfriend of Liam would reveal that she too had been attacked by him back in 2002. 
She described Liam as a sociopath, who she had been attracted to out of morbid curiosity. She said that he had strangled her and attempted to hang her with a phone cord. He'd gone to trial for rape and attempted murder, but was found not guilty after Liam allegedly forced her to sign consent notes. It would further be revealed that at the time of the murder of Emma and the attack on the Dunedin woman, Liam had actually been on a court-imposed supervision sentence and had breached that supervision three times in less than four months. Back in July of 2007, Liam had been sentenced to community work as well as nine months supervision for preparing to commit a crime, among other charges. Just 12 days after murdering Emma and three days before raping and attempting to murder the Dunedin woman, Liam had failed to appear in court. Corrections Assistant General Manager of Community Probation and Psychological Services, Tracy Miller, said that there was little the department could do when people breached supervision. She said that as long as they were turning up for appointments with their probation officer fortnightly, then there were no other restrictions on their movements. Liam actually had quite a lengthy criminal history. While he had been found not guilty of the rape and attempted murder of his former girlfriend, he was found guilty of fraudulently using her bank card. In November of 2002, he admitted to attacking two inmates with a broom handle, and in 2003, he was acquitted on a charge of assaulting another inmate with intent to inquire. He had thrown a mug of boiling water in the inmate's face and then punched him repeatedly. This revelation led to many questioning why Liam was able to breach his supervision three times in just four short months. Many wondered if something could have been done to prevent the murder of Emma and the attack on the Dunedin woman. Liam's attempt to conceal his past by simply changing his name raised a number of questions. National's Justice spokesman Simon Power would say it seemed far too easy for criminals to legally change their names and reinvent themselves, which was extremely dangerous. For example, the Justice Department, which carries out criminal background checks for employees, would only be searching for the information supplied by the employer. If a criminal had changed their name, they would be supplying that new name to the employer, and therefore it would not flag up on the system of former inmates. In 2009, Liam would appeal his conviction and his sentence. He would argue that his defence lawyer did not have enough time to prepare his defence after the late disclosure of DNA evidence, claiming that this had led to an unfair trial. His minimum non-parole period would be lowered from 26 years to 23 years, much to the dismay of Emma's family and his surviving victims. In 2012, Liam would be in the headlines of New Zealand once again when it was revealed that criminal lawyer Davina Valerie Murray, was facing two charges for smuggling items to Liam. She had been assisting Liam in an appeal and had smuggled an iPhone, cigarettes and a lighter to Liam. She was also facing a second charge of having communications with Liam that might prejudice the safe custody of a prisoner. Davina stated in the media that she believed that Liam was innocent. The comments absolutely horrified Emma's family and his surviving victims. The woman he attacked in Dunedin would state, This woman is obviously intelligent and highly educated. Yet what grounds is she going on that he's innocent? Is she going purely by what he said? As it would turn out, Liam and the lawyer Davina had been in a romantic relationship. She would ultimately be found guilty of smuggling contraband to Liam. She avoided jail time and was instead sentenced to community work and was struck off. In 2017, It was announced that Liam and Davina were married in prison. Liam's best man was Malcolm Chaston, the murderer of Vanessa Pickering. Emma Agnew had never let her lack of hearing define her. Even as a young child, she found innovative ways to connect with people who were unable to communicate via sign language. At just 20 years old, she had achieved a lot more than people much older. She had worked two jobs, both of which she loved had a wide circle of friends and had recently moved into her own home with a close friend. On that fateful morning, however, Emma came face to face with a man who had been acting on his violent fantasies with impunity for far too long. And it was Emma who paid with her life.
Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. I'd like to say a big massive thank you to my amazing new Patreon supporters, Kaylee, Laura, Catherine, They Walk Among Us, and Melissa. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon, the link is in the show notes, or you can just search for Morbidology on the app or website. In return for your support up on Patreon, I send out a handwritten thank you card as well as some cool merch. I also upload ad-free and early release episodes every week, as well as full-length bonus episodes of Morbidology Plus each month. It's a cool place to chat about the cases I cover on the podcast, or just generally chat, and I am eternally grateful for all of your support. Can I ask a massive favour and ask that if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Ratings and reviews are an easy way to support a show that you like, and I love to read your comments. Remember to check us out at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read our true crime articles. And stay tuned to the end of this episode here, promo for the amazing true crime podcast, Crime Lapse. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe and have an amazing week. We were able to discover the remains of two humans. Welcome to Crime Lapse. I am Eileen. And I am Charlie. Crime Lapse is a true crime podcast that uses primary audio, such as 911 calls, trial testimony and police statements. We carry out extensive, in-depth research using contemporary articles and case files. We use a mode of narration to give you an immersive insight into the darkest tales and most horrifying crimes. Uh, Badger's at the back of the bus, packing off pieces and eating it. Each episode details complex and obscure cases from start to finish, highlighting the aftermath and focusing on the victims. Find Crime Lapse wherever you listen to podcasts and at Crime Lapse Podcast or Crime Lapse Pod on social media. Everyone has a story to tell. Let us tell you some.